Hello there. Welcome to Planet America. I'm John Barron. And I'm Chesla Chidello. This week, as Biden seals the Democratic nomination, a curveball with plans to run an unnamed centrist alternative. Former Congressman Joe Cunningham from the group No Labels is our guest. But first... This was the week when President Joe Biden formally won enough Democratic delegates to become their presumptive nominee. And he delivered a feisty performance with his State of the Union address, allaying concerns from some the 81-year-old is too old to serve a second four-year term. In my career, I've been told I was too young. <laughs> By the way, they didn't let me on ascended elevators for votes sometimes. Not a joke. And I've been told I'm too old. <laughs> Whether young or old, I've always been known, I've always known what endures. I've known our North Star. The very idea of America is that we're all created equal and deserves to be treated equally throughout our lives. We've never fully lived up to that idea, but we've never walked away from it either. And I won't walk away from it now. Interesting nod to the idea of age discrimination. It was an unusually political address to a joint senior of Congress. Biden took repeated swipes at the former president, Donald Trump, while never actually referring to him by name. A former Republican president tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. A former president actually said that, bowing down to a Russian leader, I think it's outrageous, it's dangerous, and it's unacceptable. Not only did Biden accuse Trump of bowing down to Putin, he said that Trump posed the same risk to democracy in America that Putin poses in Europe. Meanwhile, at a campaign rally in Rome, Georgia on the weekend, Trump had this assessment of the man who beat him in 2020. What a presidency, what a president, the most incompetent president we've ever had. The worst president, the most incompetent, and the most corrupt. Other than that, I think he's doing actually quite a good job. Quick fact check on that. A recent survey of presidential historians gave all 45 presidents a score out of 100. Trump came last. The worst of all time, they say, with less than 11 points. Even worse than duds like Buchanan, Johnson, Pierce, and poor old William Henry Harrison, who died after a month in office, as we saw last week. Biden, by the way, came in 14th in this survey, ahead of Woodrow Wilson and Ronald Reagan. But... Back in Rome, Georgia, Trump also claimed it's actually Biden who poses the threat to democracy. I know you are, but what am I? 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 Infinity. Sorry, wrong clip. He's a threat to democracy for other reasons also. Number one, he's grossly incompetent. Yeah, whatever. Look, I don't know about that historian's poll of yours from before, John. Mm, pack of communists, aren't they? Took the words out right on <laughs> they're, they're raising a president who hasn't even finished his first term yet. That's how good he is. Yeah, a little bit propaganda-ish, I reckon. But Maybe. Look, I do agree as well that job one in the State of the Union was for Biden to address the swirling questions about his age. No doubt about that. Some of the ads that Trump's super PACs have been running have been brutal. I guess I should clear my mind here a little bit. We can all see Joe Biden's weakness. If Biden wins, can he even survive till 2029? The real question is, can we make America great again? Inc. <laughs> <laughs> Eerie calm and and that little cough. End, <coughs> <all dead. laughs> What's going on there? <laughs> well, look, as you say, Biden came out swinging even before the actual speech. When Marjorie Taylor Greene tried to troll Biden with her campaign gear, he just laughed at her, which is, by the way, usually the way you should go with Marjorie Taylor Greene. And his speech was similarly high energy as, as that reaction there. Last year, there were zero exclamation marks in Biden's prepared speech. This time, there were 80. And you can tell it works, because as much as Fox hosts would have loved to have focused on Biden's frailty after the speech, they had to settle for a completely different line of attack. His speech was um, so hyped up, it was bizarre. I will not be shouting the whole hour. Frankly, so at odds with everyday Joe, it's even frightening uh, to me. He spent most of the night shouting, speeding through his speech, and clearly overcompensating. I might call him jacked up Joe.
and that's being charitable. He sounded like a hyper-caffeinated, angry old man. <laughs> he finally got the word old in at yeah. the end. It was a bit Grandpa Simpson shouting at clouds. It was, mm. it was. I, I'll also say, the Fox headline writers were still doing a great job. Look at this. Old Yeller. Oh, nice. That is well done. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, even Trump has been reduced to criticising Biden's speech for being too partisan. Joe Biden gave the most divisive, partisan, radical and extreme speech ever delivered by a president in that chamber. I mean, yeah, it was partisan, but Trump criticising people mm. for being partisan and divisive? Pot kettle? Yeah. Like, he knows that's lame. Mm. And that's probably why 30 seconds later, Trump was lashing out in a particularly juvenile fashion. Two nights ago, we all heard Crooked Joe's angry, dark, hate-filled rant of a state of the union address. Wasn't it, didn't it bring us together? Remember, he said, I'm going to bring the country to, 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 together. I'm going to bring it together. I reckon that was frustration talking there, John. He mm. knows he lost this round. Yeah, but, mockery uh, doesn't really work. No, not especially not that kind. Mm. But the nature of the age issue is that it only takes one incident for it to return with interest. So Biden has to keep this up now for eight more months. Yeah, that's going to be a whole lot of coughing. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, a poll taken after Biden's speech made for moderately encouraging reading for Democrats. 29% told Ipsos Biden performed better than expected. Just 12% said that he performed worse than they expected. Over one third said... Actually, I didn't see here or read anything about the address, but asked who they now trust to do a better job as president. 36% still say Trump. 33% say Biden. 30% say... Neither of the above, thanks. Interesting. Uh, CNN had their own positive versus negative reactions poll as well. They found 65% positive reactions to the speech to 35% negative. Now, that sounds good, except that's actually Biden's worst result in his four years. And, in fact, it's the worst result CNN has found in a quarter of a century. Mm. Although that might be because lots of Republicans watched this speech as well. In fact, lots of everyone watched it. There's an average viewership of 32 million people, almost 5 million more people than last year. And, like I said, the biggest viewing network, Fox News. So, once again, Trump probably wouldn't have loved those numbers either. It was a big night for Joe Biden. That would have certainly given him the irrits. Meanwhile, the formal Republican Party's State of the Union reply was delivered by Alabama Senator Katie Britt. The youngest Republican woman ever elected to the United States Senate. The 42-year-old clearly chosen to contrast Biden. The setting, her kitchen, also seemed designed to send a signal. I am a proud wife and mom of two school-aged kids. My daughter Bennett and my son Ridgeway are why I ran for the Senate. Weird names, but okay, sure. Why is that relevant? I'm worried about their future and the future of children in every corner of our nation. And that's why I invited you into our home tonight. Oh, and it's a lovely home to be sure, Senator, but what are you getting at? Right now, the American dream has turned into a nightmare for so many families. The true unvarnished state of our union begins and ends with this. Our families are hurting. Our country can do better. She seems upset. <laughs> it's fair to say the community theatre delivery wasn't doing her any favours. No. <laughs> this comparison here was made by her local news outlet. I am looking forward to delivering the Republican response to the State of the Union, so tune in. President Biden's border policies are a disgrace. This crisis is despicable. And the truth is, it is almost entirely preventable. I, mean, I think she needs an oxygen mask. Yeah, some interesting acting choices there, and certainly worthy of satire. And now I'm gonna get weirdly seductive for no apparent reason. <laughs> right now, the American dream has turned into a nightmare. <laughs> As I was saying. <laughs> The American dream has turned into a nightmare. <laughs> Saturday Night Live there. And Senator Britt also got some criticism after she told this harrowing story and a warning it could be distressing to some of our viewers. We know that President Biden didn't just create this border crisis. He invited it with 94 executive actions in his first 100 days. When I took office, I took a different approach. 
I traveled to the Del Rio sector of Texas. That's where I spoke to a woman who shared her story with me. She had been sex trafficked by the cartels starting at the age of 12. She told me not just that she was raped every day, but how many times a day she was raped. Senator Britt went into some disturbing detail then and conclude the story with this. President Biden's border policies are a disgrace. This crisis is despicable. And the truth is, it is almost entirely preventable. However, the New York Times fact checker Glenn Kessler found that that story was highly misleading and improperly contextualised. He pointed out that the woman in question was raped in Mexico. She was never trafficked across the border into the United States. And that her harrowing experience took place between 2004 and 2008 when George W. Bush was president. It had basically nothing to do with Joe Biden, who was a senator at the time. But Senator Britt juxtaposed the two, seeming to apportion blame. And she was asked about that on Fox News. To be clear, the story that you relate is not something that's happened under the Biden administration, that particular person. Um, well, I very, I very clearly said I spoke to a woman who told me about when she was trafficked when she was 12. So I didn't say uh, a teenager. I didn't say a young woman, a, a grown woman, a woman when she was trafficked when she was 12. Oh, so it's our fault for not figuring out that she was talking about a crime committed up to 20 years ago. And it's also our fault for thinking that she was blaming Joe Biden. She was simply saying that drug cartels are bad. The entire speech is online. You can judge for yourself whether she is being grossly disingenuous or not. Well, I've made my mind up, John. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it wasn't just misleading either, by the way. It was actually inaccurate. The Mexican drug cartels did not sex traffic that woman. It was her former partner. But Brit isn't the only politician who's gilding the lily. Biden announced a bit of policy in his big speech, including raising the corporate minimum tax from 15 to 21% and establishing a new 25% minimum income tax rate for billionaires. And to drive that home, Biden said, You know, there are 1,000 billionaires in America. You know what the average federal tax is for those billionaires? No. They're making great sacrifices, 8.2%. That's far less than the vast majority of Americans pay. No billionaire should pay a lower federal tax rate than a teacher, a sanitation worker, or a nurse. So billionaires only pay an average of 8% income tax rates? That's shocking. But where did that number come from? It turns out it came from an estimate made in September 2021 when some economists looked at the changes in net worth amongst those listed in the Forbes 400 richest Americans from the year before. And then they compared those changes in net worth to the IRS data on total income taxes paid by those people. So that wasn't real data. It was a very rough estimate based on Forbes magazine. And lots of things affect your net worth anyway, even if it was accurate, they have nothing to do with taxation. Like gains made in unsold stocks or unsold property. They're not taxed until those assets are sold. And they're not taxed because that's not real income until you sell that asset. So that 8% figure is essentially garbage. And fact checkers have called Biden out on using that figure before, but he still used it anyway. He's used it over 30 times in just the last year, which is especially bad because we know exactly how much the 400 wealthiest taxpayers pay. As of 2014, it was exactly 23.1%, not 8%. Here's a graph showing that as your income goes up, so does your tax rate. There are no nurses paying higher tax rates than billionaires. Nurses may not be paying federal income taxes at all. 40% of people don't. And if we show all federal taxes, the trend is very similar. So John, that's kind of dodgy. And Biden refusing to stop misleading people is even dodgier. Yep, yeah, that's why they call it populism rather than factism, I suppose. <laughs> A new poll this week illustrates the potential impact of third-party candidates on this year's US presidential election. In Emerson's head-to-head -head general election poll between Biden and Trump, Biden is in front by two points. But if you add in independents Robert Kennedy Jr and Cornel West, plus the Greens' Dr Jill Stein, and suddenly Trump is in front. 
Now, Kennedy's politics are pretty hard to define while coming from Democratic Party royalty. He also attracts some support from the libertarian right and some weird fringes on the internet. West and Stein are certainly both to the left of Joe Biden, but now there's some competition for the centrist vote. The group No Labels, chaired by former Democrat-turned-independent Senator Joe Lieberman, is pushing forward with plans to run a centrist unity presidential campaign in November. They plan to have a Democrat and Republican together on their ticket. Names that have been floated already include former Republican Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, Democratic West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, former Republican governors and presidential candidates Mitt Romney and Nikki Haley, and Arizona Democrat turned independent Senator Kirsten Sinema. But all have ruled themselves out. Joe Lieberman says they want to offer voters a serious alternative to Biden and Trump. And he maintains their objective is also to make sure that Donald Trump is not re-elected as president. Yet, critics, including Kate de Gruyter from the centre-left group Third Way, maintain that a no-labels ticket can't win the presidency and will be a spoiler that re-elects Trump. We have been very concerned about no-labels for well over a year. Uh, what we saw was that their ticket is a unique threat to the pro-democracy coalition that elected Joe Biden and that denied Donald Trump a second term. And we have reams of data that we have been able to find that helps show that the exact voters that no labels are targeting were critical to the Biden coalition that prevailed in 2020. What we have found consistently is that there is simply no path to victory and that instead a no labels candidacy could be a dangerous spoiler, dividing the anti-Trump majority and helping him win. What we've found in our own poll that we conducted and released just last week is that an ideal ticket for no labels where they have someone very prominent like Nikki Haley, who has very high name recognition at the moment, only gets them about 9% of the vote. That is not a ticket that can win. And just to be crystal clear, that poll was with Nikki Haley mm -hmm. as their candidate, who is obviously quite popular, as opposed to the guy that they're actually currently considering, who is Jeff Duncan. Who? Yeah, exactly. I'll give you a chance, and you at home a chance to Google him if you like. Actually, no, he's not worth it. Look, it's really hard to see how No Labels wins enough states to assemble a majority, given that third-party candidate Ross Perot polled over 40% of times in 1992, and he won zero states. In fact, the last third-party candidate to win any states was George Wallace 56 years ago. Mind you, No Labels are already on 16 state ballots, so they could still be a nuisance especially given CNN got their hands on a No Labels presentation, which seemed to be mostly attacking Biden, suggesting that Biden is for open borders and is captive to a far left that wants to abandon Israel and is sympathetic to Hamas. Now, that would be making Democrats nervous, mm. I expect. It might explain why on one of Third Way's calls, someone suggested that everyone spread the message that if the No Labels candidate has one fingernail clipping of a skeleton in a closet, they will find it. And, quote, we are coming at you with every gun we can possibly find. And John, in America, you do not want someone coming at you with every gun they can find. <laughs> yeah, there's a few hundred million of them. <laughs> well, joining us now is former Democratic congressman and South Carolina gubernatorial nominee Joe Cunningham. He's now the national director of No Labels. Joe, welcome to Planet America. Yeah, thanks for having me. So there are a lot of names being bandied about at the moment. Can you explain to us how are you going to choose your presidential and vice presidential nominees? Well, look, we, we've got a group that's been uh, interviewing some spectacular candidates over the last uh, couple of months or so. And th come this Thursday, we'll be unveiling exactly what that selection process is going to look like. And then shortly thereafter, maybe a couple of weeks or so, uh, we'll be putting a ticket forward for nomination. Uh, by the by, the delegates, and and then at that particular time, that's when that ticket is or that ballot line is essentially handed off, and they start their campaign. Now, No Labels has made pretty clear that they're not planning to run a candidate unless they believe they have a pathway to victory. But what test will you use to determine if that pathway exists? We've got two candidates, presumptive nominees, that are running uh, Trump and Biden, who the uh, majority of Americans don't want to see running. The majority of Americans uh, are not looking forward to this rematch. 
these numbers, if you, you drill into them, they're unlike anything we've seen in modern history. And that's the reason we believe it provides a pathway for, you know, a, a bipartisan ticket. Six out of 10 Americans aren't happy with these two choices. So that's that's the reason that we're providing, you know, this, this third option. Um, I think we'll know pretty soon once that ballot line is offered to the candidates, they announce and they get going out of the gates. Uh, we're going to find out whether or not, you know, that appetite is real for Americans, uh, you know, and whether or not they can capture the imagination of the American public. You know, we're not interested in, um, in no labels will retain ballot, the, the control of the ballots to be able to uh, to pull it down if, if it determines that it does not have a chance of success. Joe, bipartisanship is all well and good in theory, but in practice, you are going to nominate either a Republican or a Democrat as your presidential nominee. That immediately makes it a Democrat or a Republican ticket, doesn't it? I mean, they often say the vice presidency isn't worth a warm bucket of spit. How do you get over that partisanship? Well, I think some some agreement must be made between uh, the two candidates. You know, um, you know, I can tell you just from personal experience, uh, when I ran for governor here in, here in South Carolina, I committed to having a, a bipartisan uh, a group of people in my cabinet, uh, you know, helping advise me. And the same could be done uh, with this ticket. It, you know, it, it depends upon who these potential nominees are and what agreement they come to, uh, whether or not that's uh, to, you know, discuss uh, uh, when it comes to appointment of Supreme Court justice or their cabinet or how they approach legislation. It all depends upon the personalities of the actual candidates. So let's say No Labels does win the presidency. How do you see them working with a Democratic or Republican Congress? Do you think that could work? I think it could. Look, you know, if you follow uh, how our government currently operates, um, how, you know, we don't pass a budget on time. We pass what's called continuing resolutions, CRs. And we always, every few months, we always get this clock put up on CNN or Fox saying so many hours or days until the government shut down. And oftentimes, you know, it would be a Republican president or Democratic president and the opposite in the House or Senate, they, they don't meet till the very end. And so I think, you know, having a, a an administration, a bipartisan administration where uh, you always have a pipeline to leadership in the House or the Senate, no matter which party is in control of either of those chambers, I think would facilitate conversations, would facilitate compromise. Um, you know, it would, uh, it would take out the leverage that, either the parties may have in their respective chambers. It, look, it's something new and novel. And if you ask Americans whether or not they're happy the way government works and Congress works right now, I don't think you get a, a favourable response. Your chair, Joe Lieberman, has said that the no-labels ticket would not continue if they thought it was going to cost Joe Biden the presidency. But what about the reverse? What if you being in the race were likely to cost Donald Trump the presidency? Would you continue a campaign under those circumstances? The only the only reason we'd be getting you know, nominated ticket and moving forward is if there's a viable pathway to victory. And if that pathway should dissipate um, or fall apart, uh, then we're you know we're pragmatic, we're realistic. Um, you know we're not interested in in staying in a race just to sway it one way or another. You know I, I can tell you you know look I've said this publicly and this is me personally speaking. I'm a de uh, you know a Democrat. I vote to impeach Donald Trump. I wouldn't be a part of any process that would help him uh, gain access to the White House again. That's me personally speaking. Um, you know, but I can tell you, no labels that would only be offering this ticket line if we think there's a viable path to victory. Jack Cunningham, thank you for being with us on Planet America. Okay, thanks, y'all. Bearing all the hallmarks of a corporate takeover, the Trump campaign has seized control of the Republican National Committee, the RNC. The election-denying former head of the North Carolina Republican Party, Michael Watley, is the new RNC chair. I would like to thank President Trump for his trust and support. There is no one who has been more focused on fighting for the American people, and I am grateful for the opportunity to work with him to win and help revitalize our great nation. And it's a family affair as well. Lara Trump, the former president's daughter-in-law, is the co-chair, despite earlier making this controversial pledge. Every single penny will go to the number one and the only job of the RNC. That is electing Donald J. Trump as president of the United States. 
Well, that led to fears the RNC would just become Trump's personal piggy bank as he faces hundreds of millions of dollars in adverse legal findings and fees. Another Trump loyalist, Chris La Civita, has become the chief operating officer and is expected to manage its operation strategy and spending as well while continuing to work with the Trump campaign. And with the new leadership team comes something of a staff clean-out, or what Politico described this week as a bloodbath. More than 60 heads rolling, Chaz. Yeah, although, to be fair, the RNC did need a rejig. They mm. had between 58 and $65 million in the bank at the end of each of the last three years. But the end of this December, they only had $8 million in the bank. So they kind of sucked. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, though, if they're just going to raise heaps more money just to, as you say, use it to pay Trump's legal fees. Operations officer Chris La Savita said no when asked if they'd use party funds to cover Trump's legal bills. And when asked to clarify, he responded, no. But there was an attempted resolution at the RNC weekend meeting to ensure that they wouldn't be paying any Trump legal bills, and the resolution was killed. Also, one of the committee members believes a majority of the committee want to help offset Trump's legal bills. So, that's mm. one issue. Well, if they want to give him all their money, sure. <laughs> yeah, well, it doesn't end there. The other issue is the RNC is supposed to help out all the Republicans, even anti-Trump Republicans, but Lara Trump seemed to disagree. Anyone who is not on board with seeing Donald Trump as the 47th president and America-loving patriots all the way down the ticket being supported by the RNC is welcome to leave because we are not playing games and we have no time to waste. That is going to hurt Republicans running in blue seats who need to distance themselves from Trump. Recall how Nancy Pelosi responded back in 2022 when half her caucus were gunning for her. So what do you say to your own caucus, to these young members? They're, you know, obviously in tough fights, but they want to see the change. I say just win, baby. Just win. If that's what you have to say to win, fine. And we will not in any way do anything but totally supportive. Mobilization-wise, uh, message-wise, money-wise, uh, for those people to win their races. And, John, that is the difference between a pro and a family member. Yeah, good point. Things got very real and very expensive for Donald Trump this week. He was forced to post a $91 million bond just in order to appeal against an $83.3 million damages bill that a jury awarded to writer E. Jean Carroll in January. This is for defaming her after an earlier jury found that Trump had sexually assaulted her in a New York department store in the 1990s. The former president may have now invited more defamation charges with these remarks during a phone interview view yesterday with the business channel CNBC. If I didn't win on appeal, the, the most ridiculous decisions, including the Miss Bergdorf Goodman, a person I never, I never met, I have no idea who she is, except one thing, I got sued. From that point on, I said, wow, that's crazy what this is. I got charged. I was given a false accusation and had to post a $91 million bond on a false accusation. That is for Trump is CNBC is based in New York, so he could end up in the same court again, charged Never with defamation went. again. And another fact check, he wasn't just sued and charged, he was found liable by a jury in a civil trial for sexually abusing and defaming E. Jean Carroll. The judge later made clear, yes, that means he raped her. He also defamed her again and was ordered to pay even more. And as for having never met E. Jean Carroll, well, here's a photo <laughs> of the two of them apparently meeting at an NBC party in the late 1980s. Trump's bond, by the way, was reportedly underwritten by the insurance company Chubb and he's going to be hoping there's more where that came from because he still needs to scrape together more than $450 million more to cover the judgement in last month's New York civil fraud suit. So things is getting expensive for Donald Trump. That's it for another trip to Planet America, though. We'll see you for a fireside chat on ABC News on Friday night and back here at the same time next week. And both shows are on ABC iV by 9pm Wednesday and Friday and on YouTube and Facebook as well. And as a brand new pet podcast with friend of the show, Eric Wilson. Bye-bye.